What a fantastic week of revival meetings we've had. I'm sorry if you missed it. I know you can get online and catch up with uh, where uh, God took us last week through some great deep teaching on the kingdom of God. And I think probably one of the things that really challenged me and maybe challenged us all was the, uh, the, 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 the fact of being willing to give up the throne of our hearts and our lives. Uh, I, I kind of, I really love the example of, uh, that he shared throughout the week about there being a throne and Jesus as our king sits on that throne. That's the place where he ought to be. Amen. That's a difficult message in our westernized, Americanized uh, culture where, you know, everybody can have a dream and we're, we're independent and you can just pursue your hopes and dreams and that's wonderful. But when it comes to our understanding of being a citizen of the kingdom and who our, our king, Jesus, oftentimes we don't want to give up this place on the throne. We, we want to sit here, but this belongs to Jesus. He sits on the throne. And I think one of the biggest challenges is getting off the throne of our heart and just worshiping him as our king, loving him as our king. I mean, I, we've sung songs this morning about loving him as our provider. But I don't want to just, I don't want to love the king because he gives me stuff or he provides for me. I want to learn to love the king for who he is. And that's a challenge. But not only that, but to, to keep him on the throne of my heart. That, that, that's one thing. You know, I, I, can, I can leave church and yes, you're the center of my heart, but boy, I can get out in the car and get busy with Sunday and into the week and all of a sudden, you know, maybe I haven't forsaken the Lord. I, I, I don't forsake the Lord, but uh, maybe I'm just kind of sharing it with him. I'm saying, all right, Jesus, you know, <laughs> come on, partner with me. That's not it. You know, we may have a certain thing or will that we have. We don't ask God to help us fulfill our will, our agenda, that our kingdom will, will, will come into fruition. No, sometimes we, we and I love what Dan Palmer, how he put it, we, we half cheek. <laughs> Say, come on, Jesus, you, you'll partner with me. That's, that's still not it. It's getting off the throne and allowing Jesus to be the king of the throne of our hearts. Not only then keeping him there, but then also learning to, to bring the desire to take back the throne of our heart, keeping that under subjection. That was some great teaching on the desires that still well up within us to want to take back uh, the throne of our hearts. That's, that's a big challenge, giving up the throne. Now, this week, uh, as I was processing some of this great teaching, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a visual kind of guy. I love object lessons. So in my devotions every morning, this is what I did. I, I found a stool in our home, and I, I put it in my living room where that's where I have my devotions in the morning. And I wanted to really begin to love the heart of my king more than I have before. And so what do you do when a king is present? You bow. So all week long, I was, I was on the ground. I was getting low. And I, I'm not doing this for you to say, oh, Pastor Mike, you're so holy. It's not about that at all. For me, I just needed this to be a, a, demonst a physical demonstration of how much I wanted to love the heart of my king. And so I, I would do that all week long. I'm, I'm, I'm down on the ground. And, man, I had some great moments, intimate moments, loving my king again like I, like I hadn't maybe done for a long time. But I, get, I, I tell you, it didn't take long for me to want to get back up on here for all kinds of things to begin to capture my attention from the king. Things like, well, let's see. Things like, uh, hmm, well, I got a busy day today. I got a lot of things on my schedule, so it didn't take me long for to begin to think about, you know, my appointments and different meetings and, and my schedule. And so I'm, I, I kind of felt like, okay, God, you know, kind of hurry up here. <laughs> 
I, I got things to do. Then things like, um, well, yeah, this, this, this really took front and center, church issues, things happening at church, challenges at church, maybe uh, projects, maybe things that I need to pray about, I need direction for, uh, things, uh, areas, of, there, there's some conflict or something going on. So it didn't take long for all of a sudden now this to become the most important thing. I'm praying for this and I'm praying for that. Um, then, uh, of course, I'm praying in my house, so I'm starting to think about my house, and I'm thinking, man, you know, we're empty nesters now, and we got this big house. Should we downsize? I mean, these are the crazy thoughts that are going on in my head during my time when I'm supposed to be worshiping the king. And I'm thinking, Lord, you really got to you gotta change Connie's heart because this house is big. We're empty nesters. I could walk away from this thing tomorrow, but she's not ready for that. She's like, I, I thought we were empty nesters, and so she, you know, but she loves the nest. She wants to keep the nest. She wants to stay in the nest. Lord, you got to change her heart. <laughs> so I probably got lost in that thing for about 10 minutes. <laughs> Lord, change her heart. Would you change her heart? Then... Uh, of course, this thing is dinging, you know, all, all the phone's dinging, and that's got my attention. I wonder who I need to respond to, and that's captured my attention. Oh, and then I see the stack of books sitting on that I haven't even op opened. Somebody gave me this book and said, Pastor Mike, you've got to read it. Now i got a stack of books that I'm supposed to read. I'm feeling really guilty about, you know, boy, I should be reading that because I could really grow in that area. And, and uh, you know, I, I haven't even cracked this book. And so, again, just add it to the things that kind of capture my attention. Then, of course, oh yes, this here, um, my girls and my family, you know, they would be mortified if they knew I was showing this picture. <laughs> this goes back a while, but it was the biggest picture I had of them. But so, you know, so this became some issues they're facing and um, just some challenges and some opportunities that I'm believing for good things for them. So good things, all of these are good things, but they just stole my attention. They, they took my devotion away from my king, and it was all on the things and other things as well. Oh, yeah, money. We just got our bill this week for all the student loans for our girls. And now, now we know what we have to pay every month, and I'm thinking, oh, God, we need a miracle. How are we going to do that? So that captured my attention. And, I mean, I couldn't believe how quickly all the things took my attention away from the king. How about you? Do you find that to be true in your life? We have good intentions. We know we should pray. We know we need our time with the Lord. And maybe we do, and maybe there's seasons where we're doing real good, but there's seasons when it just seems like everything is crashing, and uh, we begin to try to see the king through all our things, and you just can't do it. And what Jesus teaches us today in his word is so incredible when it comes to how do we manage, how do we, I shouldn't say manage, how do we handle all the distractions of life that come when really he just, he wants our heart. He doesn't want to do things as much for, for us as much as he wants us to trust in him for what he's already done for us and to worship him as our king. So Matthew chapter 6 is a great passage of Scripture. We were in Matthew 5 just a couple weeks ago, so we're going to continue on. This is a Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was talking about a lot of big things. He talked about adultery, how, you know, the, the law says this. If you commit it, you're, you know, you're in tough shape. But Jesus said, hey, guess what? It's even, the bar is even higher than that. Even if you think with lust in your heart, you've committed. He talks about Divorce and remarriage and money issues, all kinds of things. And Jesus raises the bar so high that we have to acknowledge, you know what? It's not about trying harder and being better and doing better. It's about trusting what he's already done. And so he goes on in uh, Matthew chapter 6, and he addresses this very important issue of the things that often uh, tend to distract us and cause us to worry. Now, Jesus made this, uh, made this statement, and we'll look at that in this passage, but I just want to bring it up right up front here. Can all of your worries 
add a single moment to your life? Why don't you just kind of ask that and answer that in your own mind this morning? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? I, th- I think we would probably all probably agree, no. <laughs> but how many of you would agree with me that probably all of our worries has taken away <laughs> maybe a few years of our life, right? I think we probably would agree with that. Because worrying is something that is a, it's a preoccupation about tomorrow. It's the desire to control tomorrow. Things might be okay at the present moment. Maybe you're doing good. But it's the things tomorrow. It's, it's these kind of things that, that grab us and we begin to worry about. So the question is, what control do we have over tomorrow anyways? I mean... Does anybody have, abs- without, with absolute certainty that you know what's going to happen tomorrow, that you can control the uncertainty of tomorrow? So then why do we give it so much power in our life? And we're so preoccupied and we desire to control tomorrow. Well, Jesus in this passage is going to teach us that the things that we're devoted to are actually the things that drive our worry. What drives your worry is whatever has your devotion, whatever has your attention. It fuels your worry. Now, this isn't just a message for 2000, uh, 2018. This, there was issues back in Jesus' day, otherwise he wouldn't have taught on it. They stressed out about things as well, and that we're going to look at it. But uh, there, there are things in our lives, too, that, that, that worry us, that grab our attention, grab our devotion. Now, I don't want to sound insensitive when I say this, but I'm not worried about your job. You know why? Because I'm not devoted to your job. Now, if you send me an email and say, Pastor Mike, I lost my job or I got laid off, I will be concerned. I will pray for you. I will maybe, if I've heard about somebody who's hiring, I'll pass that information on to you. But I don't worry about your job because I'm not devoted to your job. I don't worry about your kids getting good grades. Now, do I want them to have good grades? Yes. But I don't worry about that. I mean, if, if that's the case and, you know, if I know of a tutor, I'll give you the number or whatever. But I'm not devoted to your kids getting good grades or I'm not worried about it because I'm not devoted to that. I'm not worried about your retirement. Do I hope it goes well? Yes. Do I hope you retire early and you buy your RV and you travel or you, you're able to take all kinds of missions trips? Yes, I, I hope it works out well for you, but I'm not worried about your retirement because I'm not devoted to your retirement. My worry, and I know I shouldn't worry, but I'm human, I, I still worry too. Uh, my worry is tied to what I'm devoted to, the things that are important to me. So your list may be different than mine. There may be things that you know, I didn't end up on this stool. But let me ask you this question. What would happen if you shifted your devotion? If you were able to shift your devotion from the things to the king, where do you think your level of worry or anxiety would go? Well, the good news is Jesus actually gives us a solution to worry. Everything else you read, everything else you you hear about, you you know, uh, you learn to cope, you learn to manage, you medicate or or whatever. But I love that Jesus gives the solution to worry. Now, this is uh, what I'm not saying is that you should come out from under your doctor's care. I'm not saying that at all. But I think we need to look at what Jesus said about the solution to worry. So let's look at verse 24 of chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 and Let's hear what Jesus says about worry. He says, first of all, no one. Stop there for a moment. No one. So these are Jesus' words. And I tend to believe that anybody who can predict their death and resurrection and actually follows through with it, I'm with that guy, all right? I'm with Jesus. What he says goes. So he says no one. So don't make yourself the exception to the rule. Well, if you understood what I'm going through. No, Jesus says No one can serve, a good rendering of that is be enslaved by two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. And again, he kind of says it again. You cannot, now you can try. But what Jesus is going to get to is you can try all you want, but in the end you're going to find out that this is true. 
you cannot serve both God and money. Now, isn't it interesting that when Jesus introduces this topic of worry, that he goes right to money? <laughs> you know why? Because money seems to be the number one problem for most people, or at least the source of their worry and anxiety, tends to be money. In marriage, that is one of the top things, is, is, is money, is a source of conflict. I mean, remember a few years ago, it's the economy, stupid, right? Money is on the forefront. There were issues back then with this desire to serve both God and money. That's why Jesus is teaching on it. And so what he's saying here is you're going to have to choose. Don't make yourself the exception. You're going to have to choose uh, whether you're going to be devoted to me or your stuff. You cannot have it both ways. So then he goes on. He says, and so this, this is why I tell you that. I tell you not To worry. Now, this isn't just a suggestion. This is actually a command. Jesus is saying it's a command not to worry. Uh, Not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food, drink, or enough clothes to wear. Now, we need to pull ourselves out of the 21st century for a moment and go back to his audience. This is a first century society, a hand-to-mouth society. What you work with during, with your hands that day is what you're going to eat, is the provision that you work for that day. They didn't have elaborate uh, refrigeration systems. They had cellars and those kind of things, but they couldn't store food for, for long periods of time like we can in our re- fridges and, and freezers. They didn't have a sophisticated banking system where you could deposit money, collect interest, and pull it out any time you want to get whatever you want. This was a hand-to-mouth society, a subsistence kind of culture. And so Jesus is, 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 is really connecting with their culture. Now, we don't connect that way because, you know, we just go to the store and buy it, most of us, unless you're a farmer or a gardener that feeds your whole family. I don't know. But, you know, we just go and kind of make the purchase. So we don't, we don't toil as much like that as they did. And so for us, it would, it would be more like, you know, don't worry about things like, don't, don't worry about if you're going to be able to retire. Don't worry, uh, you know, about your singleness. Don't worry, um, you know, if, if, if how you're going to pay for your kid's college. Don't worry about uh, those, those things in the future. Uh, you know, there is enough problems for today. Don't worry about what you don't know and what you can't control tomorrow. Don't worry about... Cancer. I know everybody on your mother's side at this age got this certain cancer. Don't worry about that. Uh, don't uh, think that God has forgotten about your prodigal son or your prodigal daughter. He's saying don't worry about those kind of things uh, because isn't life more than food? And your body more than clothing? So, but, but how do you just stop worrying about that stuff? It'd be great if you could just push a button and you'd no longer worry about that kind of stuff. I mean, that's important stuff. If it wasn't important, I wouldn't worry. So how do you just stop worrying? Now, what Jesus is not saying is that you should stop caring. To, to not worry doesn't mean that you just don't care and you don't do anything and just kind of hope for the best. That's fatalism. No, it's not about not caring... We need to do everything that we can do. Did you fill out the job application? Did you return those emails? Did you, uh, did you, did you, you know, have you gotten some financial counseling? Um, are, are you, uh, you going to show up for that interview? I mean, we need to do what we can. God expects us to do that. And when we've done everything that we can, then we trust. We, we trust. We don't worry about it. Because really, there's uncertainty around all those things. There's things that, you know, we can't predict. Even if you're living the blessed life, even if you are a person of faith, that does not exempt you from the challenges, the difficulties of life. You're gonna, things are not always going to turn out perfectly. And when you look back down the road, you'll, you'll say, God, you were wise not to give me what I asked for at that time. You saved me a lot. And some of us, we don't have that patience or we just, we think that we got to make a decision and then we make a decision that has lasting consequences if we had just learned to do what we can, step back and then trust. So he's saying, okay, to not worry doesn't mean don't care. No, we still need to care. We still need to do everything that we can do. But don't live with the anxiety of over things you can't control, which is the future. And what he's going to teach us here is there is a way to face the uncertainties of tomorrow without living anxious and worried about it. So 
he, uh, he then you know, tries to pull us out of the emotion of the moment. So he asks this question, isn't life more important than those things? Isn't life more important, you know, and, and, and obviously when we're in the crisis, when the furnace breaks, when the car breaks down, uh, you know, when we're waiting test results from the doctor and we got to wait several days for that, I mean, there's a lot of emotion and Jesus is trying to pull us back out of the emotion of the moment and he asks this question, say, regardless of that, isn't life more important than all these things? And then he really brings it down to earth. Look what he says in verse 26. He says, look at the birds. Oh, that's really helpful, Jesus. Look at the birds. Now, I don't know if when Jesus was teaching on the hillside that all of a sudden a flock of birds flew over and he said, no, look at the birds. (laughs) I don't know. But, you know, I'm thinking, okay, Jesus, you want me to look at the birds? Uh, I'm facing foreclosure. And, And you want me to look at the birds? My son is flunking the 11th grade, and you want me to to focus on the... My husband just told me that he doesn't love me anymore. My wife, I'm kind of suspicious of, of, of who she's been texting all the time. And you want me to look at the birds? I'm waiting for a doctor's results. Jesus, I don't mean to offend you, but I don't have time for bird watching. I've got some more important things going on in my life. You want me to... Look at the birds. Well, he goes on and he says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. I mean, they're, you know, they're not so engrossed in all those things, just like we are. For You know, we would say, you know, uh, to, to us they'd say, don't, they don't, they don't uh, run their kids all around uh, all these events and just so that they can be well balanced. Uh, they're on every team and every club and you know, forget about church, who cares about that? As long as, as, long as they get to their event, and school and sport has become their God. And so they, 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 they involve their kids in everything just so they can be well balanced, but in exchange for that, we don't give them what they really want. And if you survey kids, and there's surveys, I don't have the statistics now, but that kids really would desire a home-cooked meal around the table. And we think, oh, that, forget that's, no, that's something that they really desire. More family time. I, my, my girls have said to me over and over, when we, when we talk about, have some family meetings about what's missing in our family, what, what can we improve on? So many times, like, Dad, I just want to spend time with you. You know, I mean, it, it really, and oftentimes what we do, we, we get so busy, and some of us, we never say no. We're helpful people. We want to help people, and we feel like it's a mission of God. We're using our gifts, and that's all good. These are all good things, but sometimes they get in the way of the king and maybe what he wants us to do, and so we never say no. We run ourselves ragged. All because of this sense that, you know, I got to do, I got to, I got to plant, I got to harvest, I got to store, and then I got to plant some more, and I got to harvest, and I got to store some more. And, and, I mean, you look at the birds, they don't have a mortgage. They don't play Fortnite every night. You know, they don't, they don't uh, get involved in all these kinds, they don't have smartphones, they don't do Instagram. I mean, (laughs) you think about the birds, I mean, what do they do? They build their nest up way up high, right? And just at the right time, they just push him out. Say, good luck. I hope you can fly. Maybe not a bad parenting model, right? And we just, you know, we put knee pads on our kids and helmets. And we, ah! You know. And we just, we run ourselves ragged. And students, they feel the same way. I just want some simple things. And so, you know, they don't, they, the birds don't do all those kind of things. And so he, he says, your heavenly Father actually feeds them. And aren't they much more valuable to him than they are? Aren't you much more valuable? This is so significant because what Jesus is trying to get through to us is that we can face uncertainty of tomorrow, but yet still not worry and be at peace. Again, his point isn't to be irresponsible. Do what you can. Work hard. Study for the exam. Make phone calls. Put yourself out there. Set goals. But when you've done that, then rest and let him take care of the rest. 
because he cares for you. Now, he goes on. Look at verse 27. Here's that question we started with. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Well, again, we would all pretty much agree no. It probably takes more away. And that's why there is such an epidemic in our country of psychiatric drugs. What I mean by psychiatric drugs, ADHD medication, antidepressants, anti-anxiety, antipsychotics. Now, I'm no medical doctor. This is just a study I've read. And in saying, in saying this or showing this study is in no way meant to bring guilt or shame on you if, if you have to take some of these kind of medications. And there's a lot of people, you know, even in our congregation that, that depend on these kind of medication. And there's no, I, I'm not, I want you to hear me. I am not bringing shame to you for having to depend on that. I think oftentimes what happens is we have prolonged stressors in our life that actually deplete the natural chemicals that God has put in our body to fight these things and prolong stress, those natural chemicals and all the things that help us be more balanced, they get depleted. So that's where we need the assistance of of some of these kind of medications to help us to function, help us bring us back up to uh, normality, whatever that is. But um, so, you know, there are... You know, that, that's kind of the, what I want you to say. I, I'm not being critical of you if, if that's your situation. Um, find, and that's why I think finding what Jesus said as so important today is the solution for that. Now, again, use it as you need it, but a long-term dependency on that, I think we'd all agree, is not something that anybody wants. Because here, look at, a, look at our country. Out of the 80 million, or 325 million people in our country, 80 million people... 25% of the population depend on uh, these psychiatric drugs. Zero to five years old, over a half a million of our zero to five-year-olds are already taking these kind of medications, okay? Um, it goes up as you get older. From six to 12 years old, 3.3 million. When you get your teenage years, 13 to 17 years old, I thought it was going to be a bigger jump, but I was surprised that it wasn't. 3.4 million. Then even as a, a young adult, 18 to 24, 5.6 million. Now, watch the jump. I was shocked at the jump here. Sorry, I got off on the wrong page. From ages 25 to 44, 21.4 million. Now, there's a little bit longer span of years there, but still. And, and you begin to wonder, okay, what's happening culturally in that age group? They're probably maybe close to being out of college. Maybe some of the college bills are starting to come in. Maybe now they're thinking about getting married. They get married. Maybe kids are getting a mortgage payment. Um, all the challenges, all the stressors of life, and you can see how maybe in that season of life there's going to be maybe a, a need for some dependency on those kind of drugs. But then that's the highest group is the next group, which really shocked me. I, I couldn't believe it. But from ages 45 to 64 years, 28 million. Look how it, it jumped again. I wonder, what's up with that? I mean, you know, I guess maybe you have, uh, you know, you have maybe some midlife things happening. Maybe you have some menopause things happening. Um, you know, now we find a lot of parents having to parent their grandchildren due to a variety of things. You got uh, people dealing with aging parents, uh, you know, a lot of different factors that would cause that number to just, just ramp up. And then the last group, it's very significant. It goes down just a little bit as well. But that group is 65 years old, 19 million. And out of the two, antidepressants, which are, are, are meant to kind of lift you, and then anti-anxiety just to bring you down, uh, more are using the antidepressants than anti-anxiety. Again, why do I bring that up? It's because it's a problem in our country. And I think we have not learned enough, especially in the church world too, but in society in general, the, the one who created us, the one who knows tomorrow, the one who's inviting us to learn to trust him better, to not focus on the things, but learn to focus on the king, if we would understand his solution. And so that's what Jesus begins to teach us here. And... Uh, 
he goes on to use another example in verse 28, another illustration. He says, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field. Boy, I would have liked to, to really had that raising three daughters. Why worry about your clothing? The fights we've had in our home over that one issue alone. Man, I should have preached this more often. All right? Look at the lilies of the field and know how they grow. They don't, they don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully, wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly take care of you. So again, he uses another illustration. We won't preach that this morning. But then he gets to the heart of worry when he asks this question. He says this, why do you have so little faith? Did you know that worry is a faith issue? Now this is Jesus criticizing those of his hearers about faith. He's the one who's saying, why do you have so little faith? Because worry is a faith issue. When you worry, you're lacking the confidence in God's willingness and his ability to help and to come alongside. Okay? Your level of worry is related to your level of faith. You worry so much because your faith is so small. Worry is a faith issue. Really, worry is prayer in reverse. Because prayer should make things smaller, and worry makes things bigger. Prayer makes God bigger, and worry makes God smaller. And Jesus nails it right on there and said, why do you have so little faith? You have so little confidence in me. You don't know the future. What, you think you're that smart that you, you, you know... And you're going to just kind of thumb your nose at me and kind of sit on the throne and do your own thing thinking you got it all figured out? And you're not going to allow me to be the king and lord of your life? You know, what's up with that? So he asked that question. So I ask you, what are you most devoted to? If you're wondering what are you really devoted to, look at what you worry the most. That'll be a sign of what you're really devoted to, what you worry about the most. What are the things on your stool that when you go to sit to pray, or maybe you don't even pray, but maybe you're just driving in your car, or maybe you know you just come out of a heated exchange with your wife and and oh you just and it 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 kills you the rest of the day, or or somebody you know uh, criticizes you, and so you just live with that offense. Day, what is it that worries you? What are you devoted to? And should it have that much control over your life? That's why Jesus said up front, he said, you can't serve both God and your stuff. You can't do it. So he goes on to verse 31, and again, it's almost like he's repeating himself. He says, so don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Again, he's He's talking to that first century culture. For us, it'd be like, you know, don't worry about finding the right job. Don't worry, you know, will I sell my house in this, is this, this market? You know, will I be able to pay for my kid's college? You know, will he text me back? Will she want to keep talking? You know, all those kind of things, we don't worry about that. And so he goes on then. He says, these are the things that dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. These are the things that dominate people who don't put their trust in me, who don't access the supernatural God of the impossible. They're, they're doubters, they're unbelievers, and this is, how, this is how they act. They run after, they seek, they devote things. He said, when you worry, you're living like an unbeliever. You're living like an atheist. You may say you believe, but that's just talk. Are you trusting God with your life? Or are we just looking to Him to kind of meet our needs? There's a difference there. And, and what happens is, is we miss such great moments in our life because, you know, we're, we're rubbing shoulders with all kinds of people who are going through the same things, same issues, same struggles, same challenges. And when we get a handle on this, they see us, and they go like, I, I don't know how you're doing it. 
wow, I'm so impressed. How I'd be freaking out. <laughs> I'd be so stressed out. I'd be, I, I don't know what, I, I, I don't know if I'd be here. And yet, wow, you have such a calm. You have such a peace. You care, you, you care, but you don't worry about it. And so Jesus, like, this is such an opportunity for you to shine brighter than you've ever shined before by learning how to simply do this. And, and he says, these are the things that dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. This is what separates the unbeliever from the believer. The believer has a heavenly Father that you can run into, that is there, he knows, he cares. Somebody who doesn't believe, a non-believer, they don't have that. They're on their own. Do the best you can. They don't have hope. They don't have an answer. They're trying to do the best they can. They're polling Facebook and Instagram surveys and, you know, what do you think I should do and blah, blah, blah. They don't have a heavenly Father. And you know what that's like? Some of you have experienced this. You've grown up where your father wasn't there. You know what it's like to be raised as a young man, and you never learned how to shake a man's hand with a good, strong grip. You never learned that. Praise God for single moms who just do the best they can. You never learned the difference between a Phillips head screwdriver or a, a, a flathead. You never learned how to change a tire. Some of you ladies, not growing up with a father, you, you never learned, uh, uh, he, he never taught you that value of who you are as a young woman. So you just give yourself to any guy because you like the attention. You never grew up with that. That's what, ha when you're not a believer, you miss out on all the things your heavenly father can give you. And that's That's tough. And thank God for the people that fill in those gaps in our lives. But that's the difference between a believer and a non-believer. So Jesus finally now comes to the solution. I've been talking about Jesus has a solution. You ready to get there? And we'll get, we need to get there quickly. Do I hear a drum roll, please? Come on, we're coming to the solution. There we go. Good. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right. Now, up to this point, he's been teasing us. He's saying, you're not as smart as the birds. <laughs> you're, uh, you, know, you don't have as, faith, as much faith as the flowers. You're acting like pagans, unbelievers. Um, so are you ready? There is something you can do. There is a solution to your worry, and it's in shifting your devotion. The solution to worry is learning to shift your devotion. And this is how Jesus says it in his own words. He says this. Seek the kingdom. Seek, not just look at it. Not just uh, think about it. Seek his kingdom. Seek, pursue, go strongly after it. Don't just uh, kind of assess the situation and explore your options. No, he says seek. Seek what? Seek the kingdom of God. Seek the king's way of life. Seek the king's way to love. Seek the king's way to act. Seek the king's way to think how to do life. I'm telling you, seek the kingdom. Seek his agenda, not your agenda. Get off the throne. Put him back on the throne. Seek what he wants you to do with his life and what you want to do later. Seek his kingdom first and where you're going to go to college second. Seek his kingdom first on, on whether you're going to be, be married or single and, 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 and your life second. Seek him first. The kingdom. Transfer your devotion to what you want and what you think, your agenda, your will, and transfer it to his kingdom thinking. And when you begin to transfer that devotion, I'm telling you, you're going to begin to experience something, and I'll share in just a moment. But I love what he says. He says, above all else. Now, maybe your version says, seek first the kingdom. First, I, I like that actually better, but above all else. So seek first, seek first. I know that for me... Every morning, the first thing I cannot do is check Facebook. I'm gone. <laughs> I'll, find, I'll see something on there, and, and, and I'm gone. I, I've been lost for however long. I, I already know I cannot 
turn to Facebook the first thing in the morning. I know that I can't turn on the news. I'm gone. I'm, I start watching the news and I get all riled and I can't come back to be with the king because <laughs> my mind is gone. I already know those certain areas that I cannot do first. And my mind is so undisciplined sometimes that, that I need things like, like I said I did this week just with an object lesson. Just, uh, uh, and, I had, and so here, this, this is how this impacted me this week. So I love what it says, above all else, above everything. All else. You know, put the kingdom above all else. So what I did this week was I began to look at all these things now that had captured my attention. And I had to begin to say, you know what? I know I do have some appointments. I'm going to honor those appointments. I've made those appointments. I'm going to follow through. But you know what? I'm going to maybe leave some margin in my day today just to get a recalibration of what I should do for the rest of the day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask God, you, God for even more wisdom as I meet with this person, talk to that person. So, Lord, I'm not going to be, th- th- this isn't going to consume me today. Um, you know, there's a lot of things going on, good and, good and challenging. And uh, I know this has tended to sidetrack me, and I've fallen in love with the church more than I've fallen in love with you. I've fallen in love with the church more than I've loved my wife from time to time. This has got in the, in the way of the king. Good, good, good thing. I mean, I love what, I, what God's called me to do. I love you. But even good things sometimes can block the view of the king. So that's got to be lowered. And all these things I should do and read and prepare for, I'm putting the kingdom above that and this whole emptiness thing. Uh, Lord, real time, you better pray for me now because I, I, I got really vulnerable with that here this morning. So I'm going to need prayer today, folks. All right? Okay. <laughs> uh, the financial thing, you know, whatever, uh, you know, I can't, I can't, God's going to provide. And uh, this thing keeps dinging and, and I'm going to be uh, a good manager of that. And these precious girls, oh, man. I'm not going to, they're not going to be my God. My life is not going to revolve around them or even Connie. And what what I had to do this week, I had to constantly go like this. Keep looking at the king. Keep looking into his eyes of fire. Keep looking. I do this too. I want to hear your voice. Hear your voice through your word. Not all the voices of all the other things and people and situations, but I need to hear your voice. And, I, and when I would get distracted, I just do this. I'm looking back at the king. I know it, it, it sounds it's very practical, but that's just where I've been this week because I don't want to lose the view of the king through all the things. And what happens when you learn to shift your devotion? All of a sudden, you feel relief. You you feel lighter. I I felt lighter. I felt like I could breathe. You know why? Because I'm not the king. (laughs) I don't have to control, try to control outcomes. I don't have to be the king. That's a pressure. I, I can't do it anyways. I'm not the great I am. I know it. I mean, I stand and preach before you sanctified and consecrated. There's no secret sin in my life. But I still know I'm not the great I am. My flaws are ever before me. I know I'm not the great great I am. And I apologize on behalf of all preachers around the world that ever blocked your view of the king because maybe you tended to idolize this person Or maybe you had higher expectations than maybe you have for yourself or other people. We're not the great I am. Now, this this is easy. Power and authority is intoxicating. Pats on the back is intoxicating. And, And sometimes we don't handle this very well. And our gifting sometimes... Uh, supersede our character, and that becomes a problem. And that's why it's more, even more important for you not to idolize people like me or people in spiritual authority because you'll be disappointed. 
you'll be let down. They're not going to come to every event. They're not going to come to every time you're in the hospital. They're not going to, uh, you know, keep up with everything going on. We're going to miss it. We're going to miss it often. And if you're looking at me as a great I am or you're looking at me to feed that in you, I'm sorry. I'm telling you up front, you're going you're gonna to be disappointed. It's my job to point you to the great I am, to the king. But for you, what, what is it that you need to shift? What is, are the things that are getting in the way of the view of the king? What offenses that you can't even, you can't even pray for your wife because you, you're so offended, you're so mad at them. What is it for you? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to shift? Are you willing to shift? Because what happens is, again, you feel a peace. It feels lighter. Maybe nothing's changed externally, but inside, internally, there's a change. You feel the peace of God that passes all human understanding. Jesus wraps up this whole conversation by saying this. He says, so... Don't worry about tomorrow. I don't know how many times he said don't worry. I didn't count it, but I mean, how many times? He just, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow, we'll bring his own word. He's already telling you there's going to be problems. I don't care how much a person of faith you are. You're going you're gonna to experience issues. There will be things tomorrow, tests of faith, whatever. Today, trouble is enough for today. So what things occupy the place of the king. What things have captured your devotion? Jesus is so clear. It's almost too simple this morning when he says, seek my kingdom above all else. Would you stand with me today? Listen, you know as well as I do that when you don't shift your devotion to God, you kind of keep it on you. You know where that takes you. You know how it affects you. You know how it affects your relationships. You know where it it takes you. You know how it affects your health. Would you make a decision today that I am shifting my devotion through all the things right to the King? Maybe you got to do this too. I don't know. But keep your eyes on the the eyes of fire. Open up your ears to to hear his voice, to to drain everything out. I don't know about you, but I'm sensing a shift. I need a shift. I need a shift in what I'm hearing, what I'm listening to, who I'm going to. I need a shift in what I'm seeing. Uh, I, I need a shift on things that have occupied my mind. I sense a shift is coming in my own life. I I know there needs to be a shift. There needs to be a change. How about you this morning? Come on. Let's just just begin even right now to begin to shift. Do whatever you have to do in this moment to say, God, I'm sorry for sitting on the throne of my life. I get off that throne right now and I bow down and I worship you, the king of my heart. And I'm going to keep my eyes on your eyes of fire because you know me. You know my future. And yes, you do have plans to to prosper me and give me hope and give me a future. God, forgive me for sitting on that throne. I get off that throne right now in the name of Jesus. You do it too this morning. God, forgive us for trying to be the king of our own lives. Being so arrogant and egotistical sometimes that our opinion that really matters. It, we're so fickle. We change all the time, anyways. God, help us to understand what you say the word of truth that transforms our mind, destroys our flesh, and waters a weary soul. God, thank you for who you are, the king of my heart. I trust you're making that confession in your own heart today. That you're making that shift. 
Now would you just receive the peace of God that passes all human understanding. Oh, God, thank you. Where have I been? I come into your presence. I come into your presence. And I rest. I rest and I trust you to do the rest. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful for the God's word this morning? Let's not just receive it. Let's do it. Amen? God bless you. Have a great week.